was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a- Sorry about that guys, here's a picture of a puppy to cleanse our palates. Well, if you can believe it, it's been 26 months since Volume 1 of Tim Miller and David Fincher's Love, Death and Robots came out, and Volume 2 has, hold on a second, only 8 episodes? I'm gonna die here. Volume 1 had 18. Now you might be asking yourself, why this huge discrepancy? Well, we know in Volume 1 that Netflix actually shuffled the order of the episodes for different viewers to see if it would impact bingeability. So while your Netflix may have started with Aquila Rift, for example, your friend Timmy's may have started with that one where Topher Grace finds a society rapidly evolving in his freezer, which is just like that Simpsons episode. Did it, did it, did it, did it. It's possible that the Netflix algorithm found out that 8 was was the optimal amount of episodes before people tuned out, hence that amount of stories for this volume. Some have even speculated that Volume 2 was originally much larger, but to avoid the amount of time between seasons, they released these eight, with the second half of Volume 2 to be released at a later date. We do know that a Volume 3 has been greenlit. In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into all eight of these stories, explaining their endings, easter eggs, and some of the details you may have missed along the way. I've also left timestamps below so you can fast forward to your favorite entries. Speaking of which, let me know in the comments below which entry was your favorite so we can crown our best entry for Volume 2. And before we begin, make sure to like and subscribe. Seriously, 92% of you aren't subscribed. And it would be my Christmas wish from Weird Pan's Labyrinth Santa if you'd click that button. In no particular order, here we go. Starting with one of my personal favorites is Pop Squad. No, not a deep dive into your favorite pop band. Pop here stands for Population. Brought to you by Blur Studios, Pop Squad is one of the studio's three entries in this volume. The other two being Life Hutch and the Drowned Giant. You know, the one where you see a penis in a circus tent. Briggs here is a member of such a squad, charged with hunting down and eradicating children in an effort to control the population. Fun fact, the voice actor who plays Briggs is also the voice of Nathan Drake in the Uncharted series, as well as the old pervert man in Volume 1's The Dump. In the first scene, we meet Ruth, who is harboring two children. These aren't her kids, she's helping out her friends. Perhaps that's why she's named Ruth, which is derived from Hebrew meaning compassionate friends. Friend. Names are important in Pop Squad. Briggs comes from Old English, meaning bridge. His character walks the line between the world of the privileged up top and the impoverished below. He's a bridge between them. Alice comes from Old German, meaning nobility. And just look at her, living in the Angel Tower, an opulent nobility-like lifestyle while the people below suffer. Finally, there is Eve, and I can't help think this is a reference to Adam and Eve, Eve being, according to the Book of Genesis, the first woman. Briggs is faced with a moral dilemma. Deep down, he knows what he's doing is wrong. For goodness sakes, he kills an innocent child. This child happens to be holding a dinosaur plushie. The irony here is that dinosaurs are extinct, and his job is to basically exterminate children. The dinosaur thus becomes a haunting reminder of his sins. It becomes a metaphor for the innocence of children. It's no wonder then that Alice is later called the Slayer of Dinosaurs, as she is complicit in this society of oppression. In the more affluent upper stratas of society, literally the upper strata, of these skyscrapers, Briggs's partner Alice loves the immortal life she lives. She, along with other members of society, undergo reju, or rejuvenation treatments which prolongs their lives. This is in exchange for not having children. So not having kids seems a small price to pay getting to live forever. The problem here is that this type of population control doesn't seem to allow for any upward mobility from those down below. Well, we can't keep letting people into this party if anyone ever leaves. It also seems that marriage is forbidden in this world. Briggs says he'd marry Alice if he could, and as she's whisked away to the party, he looks down at his bloody hands. Red also being the color of Alice's dress, her makeup and nails, both are complicit in a society that commits genocide. Both have blood on their hands, whether it be literally like Briggs or metaphorically like Alice. Briggs is almost shot by a father whose children have been killed. He's completely unfair phased by the bullet that grazes his cheek and more overwhelmed by the realization of the death and cruelty his job creates. He'll later visit Ipswich Collectibles, where the dinosaur taken from the little boy was purchased. Another Ipswich Collectibles can be found in the Drowned Giant. It's no wonder this shop is referred to as collectibles since in this world there are no need for toys. Children are not supposed to exist. The owner says some of the toys here are over 200 years old, meaning that society was structured like this for about that long. And 
I don't know about you, but total Blade Runner vibes throughout this whole story. Instead of hunting replicants, however, Briggs hunts children and their breeding parents. Eventually, Briggs tracks down Eve, who he saw purchasing a toy train at the shop. She has a small daughter, and he asks why she would want to risk her life to have one. Because I'm not so in love with myself that I just want to live forever and ever. Eve has been alive for 218 years. She's seen everything there is to see, but now wants to truly live, to see things through the eyes of a child, not dead eyes like his. Perhaps that's why the last shot we see of him is an extreme close-up of his eyes as he dies. Briggs lets Eve and her daughter live, even after she attempts to steal his gun. This is part of his character arc, but it's not truly completed until he takes on the encapsulation of the this oppressive society through the character of Pentel. The two engage in a shootout, Briggs willing to sacrifice his own life for the very thing he was sent to destroy. I like to think, however, that this ending is one with a glimmer of hope. The story ends with some sunshine breaking through, hinting that the rain will one day stop. A drastic juxtaposition to the oppressive and dreary first shot of the film. Overall, this was one of my favorite additions to Volume 2. Not only did it have fantastic visuals, but a character who had an emotional arc, and the story expressed universal themes which transcend the genre. Our second edition is Ice, and this one has a lot of hidden stuff that's easy to miss. The story follows Sedgwick, a teen from Earth who has moved to this unnamed ice planet with his family. Although never fully explained in the show, Sedgwick does not have any mods, modifications that allow individuals to have enhanced strength, speed, and agility. This has caused some resentment between him and his modded brother Fletcher. Every kid's modded like you different. That's what the grown-ups say, but they mean better. Fun fact, Sedgwick and Fletcher come from Old English words meaning sword place and bow maker. Sedgwick wants to prove himself to his brother, but deep down he wants to prove himself to, well, himself. So he sneaks off with his brother and his friends to do what teens do and stir up some trouble with the local frost whales. We also get a brief glimpse of the rampant drug problem on this isolated planet, giving the title ice a double meaning. Ice being a slang term for crystal meth. When Sedge takes a hit from this pipe, here, he trips out. But it's only when the teens run from a pod of frost whales that Sedgwick is given the opportunity to prove himself. Fletcher injures his leg and his brother is the only one to save him, the other stronger teens laughing as they rush past him. It's Sedgwick, the weakest of the bunch, who ultimately saves him. But as we'll find out in the next scene, this is all an act by Fletcher. Fletcher goes from limping on his leg to being perfectly fine. This was his way of showing Sedgwick that he has it in him to be strong. It was only by faking his injury that that he could unlock his brother's true potential and show him that he isn't the weak, useless child that his father thinks he is. It's also fitting that the animals Fletcher and Sedgwick run from are whales. In the animal kingdom, whales are said to have some of the strongest family bonds, and this entire story is ultimately about family and the relationship between these two brothers. Volume 2's third offering is Automated Customer Service, the one with those really freaky elongated faces. Seriously, this photo can't even capture her entire visage. I'm sorry I heard that word and really wanted to use it. We do, however, get adorable puppies. The story takes place in Sunset City, a fitting name for its residents, all elderly, are in their twilight years. This future sees a world where almost everything is automated, from tennis matches, beauty salons, and yes, pooper scoopers. But along with that automation, so too is the customer support, which our main character Jeanette calls after her vacubot unlocks Skynet and goes rogue. Well, it's actually called Purge Mode, sign me up. One of the things I like about this entry are the subtle ways it sets up our characters. Our friendly neighbor Bill strokes his phallic-shaped gun as he watches Jeanette in some suggestive yoga poses. It's Jeanette's yoga flexibility and Bill's gun which will later help her defeat the vacubot. But vacubot's defeat alerts all the other electronics to drop everything in pursuit of Jeanette. Jeanette and Bill. It's fitting that the last shot of Sunset City is of a sunset. There's also a fun little Easter egg of the Sunset City Meat Department. Meat Department is the director. Great name. The shortest entry of the bunch, which also happens to be stop motion animation, is all through the house. Of course, that being a line from poet Clement Clark Moore's famous poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, which was written in the 1800s. St. Nicholas, however, isn't what you'd expect. When Billy and Leah creep down to get a glimpse of jolly old St. Nick, it's a terrifying creature which vomits up presents. A fun easter egg here, another classic stop motion Christmas film plays on the television in the background. You know those old school Rankin Bass Christmas specials. What I think is really cool here is that this terrifying Santa creature is able to tell if the children are naughty or nice, and thank god they're on the good list. I'd hate to see what happens if they were naughty. What would have happened if we weren't good? 
Billy ends up getting a sweet train set, and one of the things I wish Love, Death, and Robots did more was add more connections between all of these stories. For example, the train here could have easily been a replica of the one we'll see in The Tall Grass, or that we see you purchase at Ipswich Collectibles in Pop Squad. Speaking of The Tall Grass, that's our next entry, and no, it's not based on the novella In the Tall Grass by Stephen King's son, Joe Hill. Netflix did a feature-length movie on this a while back, which was the scariest thing to happen in a farmer's field since Children of the Corn. You just sit there, seize him, punish him, cut him down, I command you! Those are some mad Joffrey vibes. Why you did that and bring him to me? This is Laird, our protagonist for this nine minute journey. He's reading the new Glasgow Financial Times, which could suggest this takes place in Nova Scotia, Canada. The animation studio is, after all, based in Canada. A particular note is this article that reads, West Coast businesses flourished amidst New World's economic growth. It's a conscious choice by the director to set this story during a time in which the world is changing. The steam train symbolizing modernity, a stark contrast against the farmland of the old world around it. Laird is likely a well wealthy businessman traveling west. His name comes from Scottish for a wealthy estate owner. When the train breaks down, Laird's curiosity leads him into the tall grass where he uncovers these blue zombie-like creatures, only to be saved by the railway man who says this isn't the first time it's happened. He doesn't know who or what these creatures are, but he imagines they were once people, people who were left behind or perhaps from another world. Is the director trying to say something about how changing times leave people behind, or is it more simplistic? Like if a railway man tells you not to stray in some creepy grass, don't do it. We won't know for sure. Now, I wasn't able to get a copy of the short story, but if any of you have read it, I'd love to know in the comments below if it offers any further clues. Next up is Life Hutch, named after the life support unit our character Terrence, played by and modeled after Michael B. Jordan, finds refuge in. He has crash landed on an unknown planet after engaging in a firefight with an alien entity. And I don't know if it's just me, but these things look a lot like the coronavirus, and considering the whole story of of Life Hutch is surviving in an enclosed space, it's completely possible this is an allegory for the pandemic. An unknown entity has forced you to stay indoors until you can get a vaccine and are rescued. Yes, I know those are actually painkillers. The majority of the story, however, focuses on Terrence surviving a malfunctioning service droid. It's a grim reminder of our reliance on machines. When push comes to shove, we can only rely on ourselves to get us out of these life and death situations. The story ends with Terrence exploring the droid's weakness of attacking moving objects, kind of like how a cat chases a laser beam. He's able to use the droid's own metal parts against itself, putting it down for good until rescue can arrive. Although not the most unique or compelling story, the animation here at times looks insanely realistic and just goes to show you how far we're coming with CGI. Perhaps one of the most philosophical entries in Volume 2 is Blur Studios' The Drowned Giant, based off the short story by J.G. Ballard. Ballard was considered a new wave science fiction writer who tried to challenge traditional science fiction conventions showing that the genre can be more than just pulp comics and alien rags. They even name a butcher shop after him near the end of the story. You might think our protagonist is the narrator, the scientist Stephen, but I'd argue it's actually the giant itself. The narrator merely acts as a mouthpiece for how the giant changes and affects the people around it. What starts as a wondrous event filled with mystery surrounding this strange occurrence slowly devolves into one of sadness. I couldn't help but feel pity for the giant as the townspeople began desecrating its body, facing it with graffiti, throwing litter nearby, using it as a slide, and chopping its body apart. Later its meat will be boiled, its skull found by a nearby farm, and eventually will be forgotten. The irony here is that the giant starts off as a myth, becomes reality when it washes ashore, only to turn back into a myth as the people forget about him. The narrator remarks how the giant's memory has long since been forgotten, and one of the few remaining parts of him, his penis, is the only thing left, floating in a circus tent mislabeled as that of a whale. Don't you just hate it when your dick gets compared to a whale's? Really, this story is about our own humanity. We, like the giant, eventually fade away and live only in the memories of those who continue on. The narrator ends the piece dreaming of the giant's resurrection as he picks up fragments of himself and journeys back to the sea where he came from. He came from myth, and so too ends in myth. For such a bleak 
story, I did find this ending to be rather hopeful. The narrator's outlook was one of resurrection and returning the giant to its godlike status, not the being that washed ashore which the narrator and myself pitied. Although this isn't a conventional story, I'm curious what you guys thought of the drowned giant. Let me know in the comments below. The last and one of my personal favorites in Volume 2 is Snow in the Desert, and I got a total Mad Max vibe mixed with a little bit of Star Wars. We are on a sweltering desert planet with these carrion-like creatures who have stone-like wings to shield them from the sun's scorching rays. Wearing white and sporting white facial hair is the aptly named Snow, who has ventured into town to collect what we'll later find out to be our strawberries imported from Earth, a rare delicacy. As you can imagine, water is in high demand here. These torture devices on the outskirts of town show you what happens to water thieves. Snow only ventures into town about once every month to collect his strawberries, and it's probably for the best since he's a wanted man. His bounty looks to be about 15 million, whatever form of currency they use here. This has been put up by the merchant Barris, who we'll later meet in the final act. Not seen is this other wanted person, Toxin, who is of the Octon race. And I love this because it's just fun world building. I'd argue that this world, more than any of the others so far in Love, Death, and Robots, is the one I'd most like to revisit. At the nearby Starbucks, Snow orders a drink, and here's another great example of this world building. Drinks are so precious here that they have their own safety lock, which have to be opened by the waiter, and it wouldn't be a sci-fi cantina scene without a few bounty hunters. They've tracked Snow down and are looking to collect his balls. Literally, his balls have a gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is a real hormone that increases the production of sperm or ova, depending on your sex. Snows have healing properties, which allow him to rejuvenate quickly and grant him immortality. He gets his hand blown off in the bar shootout and later says it will take less than a week to regrow. It's here he meets Harold, who joins him on his journey back home. They cool down in this tent during the day, under a refreshing mist to protect them from the heat. Again, just another great bit of world building. Harold tells Snow that she actually works for Earth Central Intelligence. She wants to find him before the bounty hunters do because whoever can decode Snow's reproductive ability can control immortality. In the wrong hands, this could destabilize what she calls the Protectorate. Snow makes an offhanded remark, pretty funny that he lost his hand, that Earth is controlled by an AI, so he's not too excited about joining her back to Earth. For Snow, immortality is a curse. He says that his wife died 123 years ago. She, unlike him, grew old and he's been on his own since. Perhaps why he so easily hops into bed with Hero. Well, it may have been centuries since he last felt the touch of a human, the irony here is that Hero isn't a human. When they're attacked by Barriss' men, Herald is shot and it's revealed she's a synth. Well, not a hundred percent synth. Years ago, she was in an accident where parts of her spinal cord, nervous system, and brain were salvaged and put into this synthetic body. She, like him, tells him it's been a long time since she touched another. Harold's synthetic reveal gives us insight into her motivation. Of course she'd want to make sure Snow's healing properties aren't in the wrong hands. If this rejuvenation power was around when she had her accident, it might have prevented her from becoming a synth. So we kind of see what drives her character. The story ends with our two characters embracing, both accepting each other's true selves. The image fades to white, the color of snow, and I'd like to think he'll join her on her way back to Earth. So those are all eight of Love, Death, and Robots Volume 2 entries, and I want to know which ones you thought were the best in the comments below. Before you leave, make sure to like and subscribe, it really helps the channel out, and for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.